Did you always know that Maria had a disability or was there a time where you thought that every family operated as yours? Oh yeah, no, I know. I 100% knew she had disability, but I was like, okay, so what? The sky's blue. You know, that's just what it was. That's that I never really cared. I thought it was, I, I thought it was a feature, not a bug. Do you still feel the same way? 100%. How old are you two today? I'm 23. Well, I'll be 24. We're both born in July. She'll be 21 and I'll be 24. If you were to introduce your sister to the world, what would you say? Okay. Well, what I would say is, um, she, oh man, there's a lot of things I could say. Um, I would say this is Maria and she loves dogs, mainly animals. She loves to play. She loves to be around her family. What is the number one thing you want others to know about your daughter? Wow, that's a great question. You know, in a sense, she's just like every other kid. That, I mean, yeah, she's different to look at, but, um, you know, she has feelings and thoughts and desires and, and she wants the same access to life that everybody else has. Mm -hmm. and, she may not be able to communicate it the way everyone else does, but she's just she's just a she's just a person in the world, just like everybody else. She just presents very differently. I think the most important thing when it comes to understanding her is okay. Wait, 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 wait. Right, mommy's gonna come see Maria in a second, but we it's just Timmy talking. Do you want Timmy to get off, doggy? Yeah. Okay. She's, She's very specific about this. Okay, can you do this? Yeah. Okay. What is that? So this is rice. Sometimes it can be sand. Usually it's either rice or sand. And what this is, is simply, it's a, it's sensory pleasure for her. Uh, it's a calming mechanism. We've had seasons where it's, been extreme in terms of just keeping sanity mm -hmm. on a given day because the behavior was self-injurious, destructive, highly agitated all the time, screaming, a lot of screaming. We've had that season. Um, and the you have your limits, we all do. Um, especially when there's sleep deprivation involved, which there was years and years mm -hmm. of that and a lot of it. Um, and Marcia would always say to me, she doesn't want to be this way. Yeah. I would say that the rice, especially the rice mm -hmm. uh, or the kinetic sand, keeps, allows her to go into a place where she wants to be. Mm -hmm. It's just where she wants to be. She doesn't sit around watching movies or YouTube. She doesn't have, doesn't have a favorite YouTuber. She doesn't have a phone that she goes on. And so her reward system is ultra, ultra, ultra sensitive. And I think that's a really positive byproduct of her condition situation that she can just enjoy really, really simple things. And she can be- Such as the rice? Like, yep, like the rice, exactly. That this is, this is enough, this will do it. I feel her needs and emotions in a more serious way than I take my own. And I take, what she goes through in a way as if someone did it to me, but like times two. That's how, that's how I've always been with that. What is your first memory of feeling that way? Um, whenever, um, so for a while we were in elementary school together and whenever I, she would be with her life skills class on the playground and things. Um, or she would, she would even sometimes stop by my class to do certain reading exercises with certain students. Um, I was always just on the radar, making sure everything was good. How are the kids interacting with her? What are they saying? Um, it's, it, even when it comes to other family members, I know that they're family, but I'm still in the, I'm still in the same role. I'm like, uh, I'm like, okay, mom, I don't think that's the right thing to do here. Dad, I don't think that's the right thing to do here. Not because they're being malicious, but I'm always looking out for that. That's how I've always been from, from day one. I love that she has an older brother. I love that he loves her the way he he does. Um, 
we couldn't have asked for a better brother-sister relationship. Even when I was little, never questioned my love for her, but uh, there were some thoughts which was like, oh, what would it be to have a normal younger sister? Now where I'm at is, um, this is one of the most amazing things that I have as an identity in my life is that I'm a big brother to my sister with these conditions. What is Mireya's diagnosis? Rhombin cephalosynapsis. And we're gonna introduce a word you haven't heard yet, Chris. Gomez Lopez Hernandez syndrome. What does that mean? <laughs> I'll let you explain it. <laughs> oh, great, 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 great. Okay, so we talked about Rhombin cephalosynapsis once prior, uh, earlier before we started. And that is uh, the little brain. It's the cerebellar or the cerebellum. It's the hind brain and it sits in the back, underneath the back of the brain. It's a separate structure to the best of my knowledge. It is two hemispheres, consists of two hemispheres with a midline that develops between the two hemispheres. That midline is called the vermis. Vermis in Raman cephalosynapsis goes partially developed or wholly undeveloped to whereby you have no separation of the two hemispheres of the cerebellum itself. Vermis, I don't want to say controls, but regulates, is principles in Motor function and mobility. Locomotion. Locomotion. Yeah. She wasn't going to survive her, her own birth. She was kind of a free no. pregnancy. Like if I was sick, I could take anything I wanted because she wasn't going to survive it anyway. But I would feel her move and I would know, no, there's something there. This is a movement, just like it was when I was carrying um, her, her brother, Timmy. And I, I connected no. with her right then and there. I knew, yes. I knew that there was something there. Do you want doggy? Um, yeah. And, and then when she was born and we, and we saw what we were dealing with, um, you just like any other parent, you do whatever you can to comfort your child, to learn about what's going on with your child. Um, there's just no difference. There's no difference um, in caring for a kid like this when you're um, presenting with a kid like this than any other parent with a normal child. You just have more things to figure out. Yeah, yeah. And my sister once said to me, she said, I don't know. How, I, don't, I don't think I could do that. And I said, yes, you could, because you're a mom. You do what you have to do. So. What do you think when people say, I don't think I could do that? Um, and I, you know, before I got pregnant, I would look at um, families with, with children with disabilities, and I'm like, oh, I just couldn't. I'm not that kind of a person. I'm not, I'm not patient. I'm not, I don't have the endurance to, to handle a kid like that. Um, and then most people just look at us and go, I just don't have it to do it. I don't have those skills. Um, I'm too selfish, I'm too whatever. And, um, and you just learn, you learn as you go. Gomez Lopez Hernandez syndrome informs stature, mm -hmm. mostly, most notably the lack thereof. Mm -hmm. She's only four feet six. She's, uh, she stopped growing, so this is her, this is her, what she will be. It informs her intellect, so that's the, that's the delay, developmental delay. Can you talk about the head nodding? Yeah, so, so her head movement is a big thing. And it's, it's so, my selective focus has adjusted over time where I don't, even see, I don't even see it anymore, so thanks for bringing that up. So she moves her head back and forth. Um, she's always moved her head back and forth. And it's been somewhat of a mystery to us of why she does that. We think it's somehow, it might be a form of regulation for her system. Um, it might be simply because of uh, it's just a byproduct of the certain medical complications or physical disabilities she has. It could be something that allows her to have comfort. When she was really little, um, she would lay, when she would lay down, her way of adapting head movement was she would roll back and forth. So even when she was laying down, she would roll back and forth like this to still give her that sense of movement. So that's kind of what's always been for her is, just, is, is that way, yes. She was delivered full term with a very large head size. She was 58 centimeters, 
uh, adult average head size circumference is 53 centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, birth or delivery normal child circumference 33 centimeters. She was basically the body of a four or five pounder when she was born. She was full term. Um, however, her head size, she was born nine pounds, 15 ounces because of uh, gestational hydrocephalus. Um, by the time she was born and delivered, her head probably was half of that nine pounds, 15 ounces to some degree. Um, she was so tiny that we would carry her everywhere we went when we went out into public. And we had a lot of difficulty bringing her out into public in kind of more normal mode. Um, the moment we got the wheelchair, all of a sudden it's like the seas just parted for us. People had a, a, a trigger or an alert mechanism that they understood instantly there's something to be very mindful of here. Mm -hmm. How can I help? How can I help you? Oh, let me get out of the way. This funny story, which is uh, she used to not uh, call mom, mom. She used to call her actually Timmy's mom. So you refer to me as Timmy's mom. And mom used to have this big longing for, I wish that she would just call me mom. And uh, she didn't know what she was doing with that wish. And so now it's mom, 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 24 seven. She never stops. And uh, um, big attachment to mom, loves mom so much. Um, that's who she's been around mainly for the longest time, just in how the care has worked out. And so whenever someone would come over, someone not here, unfamiliar, cause she goes by patterns. She has a big pattern recognition. It's kind of how she navigates the world. Uh, what would happen is she would get skeptical because usually someone would come over to relieve mom to go do other things, right, outside the house. And so she would get skeptical. Okay, if someone's here and they're not usually here, it's most likely because mom's going to leave. So with you being a new entity in the home, um, she's in skepticism mode about mom's still going to leave at some point, even though we're reassuring her mom is staying. So that's what she's doing right now. And I think that's an indication of her intellect and how she perceives things and how she is taking things in. Mm -hmm. I, I, I honestly believe, this is my theory, is I almost believe, honestly believe that um, how she experiences the flow of time and how she experiences um, order in the world is through um, us as a family. What is mom doing? What is dad doing? What is Timmy as a brother doing? Right? And so if mom's doing certain things at a certain time, for her, that's almost as, is the sun, has the sun come up, has the sun come down, right? Are the seasons changing? That's what mom and dad and us as a family actually are to her. So that's a very big part of how she uh, feels safe in the world. If you want to make Maria laugh, what do you do? I cough or sneeze. You want me to do it? Yes. Okay. Maria, you want daddy to cough? Want daddy to sneeze? Yeah. <laughs> the hands go happy, the head shakes more. <laughs> Are you happy? Yeah. Remember. Oh, you're not going to give it to me. Okay, all right. We've got a little mode of communication. It, it comes from Barney. A Barney, doll, a Barney doll that speaks, um, and he will say, remember, I love you, you press his paw. And I was able to develop that sequence with Maria, and it was always at night before she, right when she's laying down and going to bed and we're doing the night-night tuck-in, kiss you, love you stuff. And uh, I was able to, years and years and years ago, and very quickly, simply say to her, remember, after walking her through the Barney course, um, using that doll, uh, and she will say, I love you. Um, so if I get the teeth chatter, when I say remember, <laughs> that's her saying, yeah, I'm not there. Not at all. Not happening. Is your relationship to seeing how other people interact with your sister, has that changed over the years? Are you more protective, less protective? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I am very... I am very on alert for how people interact with her. I want to make sure that they know what they're doing. I want to make sure that they know what not to do. There's no lines being crossed. I'm still, I still have very much that in me still. But of course, you know, 
the people that we take her around are people that I love and that we trust, so I know, right? But there's still that part in me that's like, you know, you know, there, there has to be reverence for who this is. And, uh, I'm gonna be, I, and I'm gonna be the one that enforces it. Let's create a little guidebook for people meeting Maria for the first time. How should they interact with oh, her? Oh wait, can you stay here? No! But, but Maria, I thought we wanted to do the interview. Can we please do the interview? You're gonna make Timmy sad. Can you please stay and just do the interview? Yeah. Okay. Look, all we have to do is play the interview, and you can play in rice. Huh? Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, here you go. Have you always known how to calm her down? I th honestly, I think so. I think so. I, all of it's been intuitive. I didn't have to really learn anything. I just always know. Let's get back to that question about kind of creating a guidebook yeah. for how people should meet your sister and interact with her. Mm -hmm. Let's start with some, some pros. What should people do when they meet your sister for the first time? Mm, this is good. Okay. Um, I think when they should meet her for the first time, I think a lot of people assume that normal verbal conversation can ensue. I think the first thing that people should, should, should know is that um, simply just being present with her is enough communication on its own. Uh, she's very, very, very aware of her surroundings, even though she won't verbally express it. How prevalent is this diagnosis? Um, we checked, see, 2020, as of 2020, 90 known cases. So it's, it's pretty rare. She was born in 2002, but we didn't get her diagnosis until 2010. So, um, so it took eight years to get the diagnosis. We didn't know anything about why this was happening, and now we know. Are there any things people should avoid doing when meeting her? Um, I think uh, she doesn't like loud things, loud noises. She doesn't like high-strung energy. I think that that, uh, that kind of freaks her out a little bit. She doesn't really know what that kind of means. Um, I think it's a little bit too much on the, on, the, on the system for her. Like, for example, like sometimes we can achieve a show being put on the TV or watching a movie with her, but most of the time, or playing music, most of the time she's like, I don't wanna do that, that's too much right now. Too much going on. So, uh, she likes things to be very low key, so just coming, just being very present, almost silent, just, you know, um, a kind of energy that isn't too much. Is there anything others can do to be more inclusive of your family? I don't, personally, I don't, I mean, I don't think that we're necessarily entitled to, to anything, really. Um, I think it's our, our place to advocate for her if yes. we think that she needs that. But, um, yeah. but no, I actually, I actually think that, um, that that's not an entitlement. I, I think it's, it's up to us to, it's, it really is. To, um, to help her find yeah. her place. When you take full accountability for your entire situation, does life tend to get better? It does. It's freedom. It's mm -hmm. because it's truth. Yeah. And the circumstances don't change. The conditions don't change. But now because you know truth, you can articulate it. You have understanding. And I don't know what it is about just... You have hope is, is, is what ultimately results. There's, 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 there's hope that's found. I have a responsibility to bring her to the world versus asking the world to come to me. It's on me, 100%. They're out there, they want to, but they'll never know and they'll never have the opportunity to unless I give it to them. I have to be vulnerable. If you could give yourself a piece of advice when Maria was first born, Ooh. what would you say? Oh my gosh. You go first. I've already, I, I, I know this one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've had to articulate this for myself. And we've been talking about it a lot lately uh, as we're transitioning. So Tim, uh, he moved out uh, last year. And so in effect, while we have Maria in the home, we are empty nesters uh, for all intents and purposes. This is adult care uh, going forward is mm -hmm. what this is. Mm -hmm. um, that's an A. It, there's a lot of, there's a lot of regret and there's a lot of hurt there. I, I moved out of the house just last year in September. Yeah. 
And Mom. even though it hasn't really been that long, not being at the home every day, seeing her Mom. every day. And I'm gonna go bye bye. No, we're not gonna go bye bye. We're staying at home. Everyone's staying at home. Mommy's staying. Daddy's staying. Timmy's staying. Where are you staying? Um, what it's really been is that separation and being away from the home and living on my own, doing my own thing and coming and doing regular visitation with her has, that separation has solidified many things that were not solidified before. Um, there, there are actually many nights where um, I had to grieve and mourn and even cry the kind of things that I think I didn't see while I was here. And that made me appreciate things that I never appreciated before. Um, to the point where, um, long term, I can't be away from her, regionally, geographically. Um, this can only be for a time, but long term, I have to be with her. If I could go back and tell my 31-year-old Tim Howard self at the time at which we received the news uh, of mm -hmm. her condition and uh, what we were looking at and going forward, I would tell him to not in effect stop everything, but reevaluate and reassess. Mm -hmm. I would tell myself, hey, I'm home at five o'clock every single night and I'm at work at 8 a.m. every single morning and I'm gonna deny any and all promotions uh, that may come along. I'm not gonna fight for them. I'm not gonna strive for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna strive to provide and be home. Um, but anything that's extemporaneous uh, to that and to the home, and we're gonna, and we're gonna do everything together. Everything, absolutely everything. I know that I, I, I seem a little blunt uh, in saying that, but I've, I've, I've had a lot of time to think about this recently because of the regret that's there. I could have had so much more. I, I lost out, I missed out. Even in our small, still, quiet, humble uh, goings-ons and, and going about uh, and living and doing life uh, as, a, as a family with these kind of limitations. Um, <clears throat> uh, no, I would have, um, we would have done every, we went under, we had so many deep dive moments, near tragic, right, all medically based, um, that our instant strategy was divide and conquer. And what I learned was that, the lesson I took from that, that you can do that, you can divide and conquer, but if you don't come back together, if you don't get through your guy and your guy and meet each other on the other side, yeah. um, but just keep on going, then that's where everything starts to erode over time and it breaks down. I wanna say, everything different. I would forgo myself. I would go forgo the trappings of the world, everything that it has to offer. Be normal, uh, if you will. That's it. And, and I would yeah. just be home and be present and together um, because that's where the strength comes from. That's where you find the strength mm -hmm. is, is doing this together. You can't. Right now, Tim Jr. is to the side. Mm -hmm. Interacting Sneeze. with Maria and helping her stay calm. <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> what is it like for you to see their bond? Um, thank God for him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank God for him. He's such an important part of this dynamic. What's your biggest goal for your, your sister's future? Um... I think my biggest goal for her future is, uh, I think it's a few things. I think one of them is that we can have a, a series of positive men, uh, medical breakthroughs, such uh, as, uh, oh, wait, 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 we're still talking, Timmy, can Timmy talk? You, you don't like Timmy talking. Sometimes she doesn't like us talking unless she's involved. Maria, can, can Timmy talk to Chris? No! Oh. But Maria... We have to talk to Chris. No! Okay, does that make Maria mad? <laughs> Maria, does it make you sad? I'm not having it. Okay, can, can Maria talk to Chris? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, can you say hi to the camera? Hi, Maria. Mom. Can we do a hi one? Mom. 
Thank you for doing a high one with me. She was like, I'm done with this. Is she, is she able to communicate her feelings pretty effectively? You know, sometimes and other times, no. Um, she screams, but that scream could mean a bunch of things. Um, she could get very antsy, and that could mean a bunch of things. Um, and uh, a big part of my role in the family has been to try to focus on any particular nuance that could allow us to discriminate against what we should do in this particular moment. And Tim just called me when he was on the road the other day saying, Dad, you know what? As he was driving through a, an area that is very, very familiar to us, which is the route that we take to go to Seattle Children's Hospital. And he called up just to say that, Dad, you know what? I want to tell you, I love all those times I had to go with Mom and Maria to Seattle Children's, all those appointments over all those years. I miss them and I wouldn't have it any other way. And so we develop our own mm -hmm. special areas and special moments. They're different. Mm -hmm. They're on the way to Seattle Children's. They're after Seattle Children's when we go to IHOP because that's where Maria likes to go or the McDonald's on the way home from Seattle Children's at night. And Tim likes this and Maria likes that. You like the smoothies, right? <laughs> but they're special, it's, it's what we have. And, and so while not you know, ideal, what have you, but it, it's so beautiful, it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. When somebody finishes watching this interview, what do you hope they remember most from it? Um, I would like them to see that we're a family, just like every other family, that we have the same hopes and dreams that every other family has. I hope that they see that we, we, we love each other, we love her. We try and give her the best environment that we possibly can. I can tell while you talk about Maria, you have a big smile. Mm -hmm. Tell me about you, the pride you have being her brother. Um, I would say that the pride I have being her brother is, uh, uh, there is no measure on it. Yeah, there is a, uh, um, I, uh, a lot of people would look at her and um, see either mental or physical um, deficiencies of things that store things are atypical. Um, but in, in my eyes, and always it's always been like that before I even laid eyes on her when she was pregnant, when my mom was pregnant with her, is uh, I always saw her as perfect, absolutely perfect. I see absolutely nothing wrong with her. Um, and I would, uh, I'd do anything for her, uh, always have. Um, and, um, you know, from the, as long as I can remember, my main goal was to never ever show anger or any kind of um, negative feelings towards her because I just don't think she deserves that whatsoever. So um, I've always been her main protector when it comes to things. Um, very in tune to what she's feeling, very in tune to how she is, and because uh, I just think that's what she deserves. 